And we're going to listen to the next presentation by Mr. Bill Rosenblatt from Giant Staff's Media Technology Strategies. Let's meet him through the video. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Rosenblatt. I am president of Giant Steps Media Technology Strategies, which is a consulting firm based in New York. And I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about copyright infrastructure at internet scale. Just a little bit about me. Um, I am a consultant, as I said, with a focus on digital media and copyright. I've worked with several Korean businesses and I've spoken at Icotech a few times in the past. It's a great conference. I am an adjunct professor at New York University in the music business program. And I'm the author of a book on digital rights management and a forthcoming book that will be out next year on technology disruption and the music industry. So today I want to talk to you about the need for rights administration at internet scale. The idea is that content is copied and distributed at internet speed and scale today, and there is a rapid pro proliferation of distribution and access models for digital content. The licensing of that content has to happen at the same speed and scale as the distribution, because if that doesn't happen, then consumers will gravitate to unauthorized content and creators will not get paid. So what we need is something that we call copyright infrastructure. And this is a term that I heard a couple of years ago uh, in, uh, in the European Union, and I think it's a great term, so I've adopted it here. And what does that mean? Well, it means several things, including complete, precise, and accurate, and up-to-date or current data about rights, royalties, rights holders, and so forth. It means the ability to identify content, to identify rights holders, it means good metadata about content, protocols for conveying all that information among different parties and transactions, and it means data repositories and registries to hold all that data and to track uh, transactions. <clears throat> so where do these come from? They come from a combination of different places. They come from laws, they come from industry conventions, just the way that entities in the industry do things. They come from standards, which Stella Griffiths talked about uh, this morning. They come from entrepreneurship, from entrepreneurial activities that create uh, new technologies and new practices. And they come from the identification of best practices, what works versus what doesn't work. I'm going to give you an example to show you the need for scalable copyright infrastructure. And it's a U.S. A streaming music example. This is what I'm most familiar with, and the U.S. is a complicated market. It's a big and complicated market, so there are a lot of different moving parts here. Let's say that somebody plays a song on Spotify, and the song specifically is Bad Romance by Lady Gaga. I chose this song because it's actually pretty simple compared to a lot of modern pop songs that have a lot more different rights holders and composers and so on. So, <clears throat> Reading from left to right, we have three different royalty streams here. These are the three most important. On the left is the mechanical royalty on the music composition, which is essentially like the music and lyrics to the tune, the song. In the middle is the performance royalties on the composition. Those are treated separately in the US for music streaming. It's not true elsewhere in some other places. And then on the right, we have the sound recording, which is the recording of Lady Gaga's performance of the composition. Uh, and the label here is Interscope, which is a label of Universal Music Group, the largest uh, recorded music company in the world. So we've got various entities that are involved here, three of which are music publishers in the blue boxes on the left. And they are House of Gaga, which is Lady Gaga's music publishing company, Songs of Red One, which is the music publishing company of Red One, the producer, uh, Nadir Hayat is his real name. And then in the middle, we have Sony Music Publishing, which is one of the major music publishers, and they act as an administrator or sort of a back office processor for these two publishing companies. Then on the right, we have the recording artists who are also the co-composers of this tune, Lady Gaga and Red One. And we have different royalty streams that are shown in italics, which I won't go over in detail. 
but there are several elements of copyright infrastructure inherent in this set of royalty transactions that get kicked off whenever someone plays this song on a streaming service such as Spotify. On the musical composition side, one element is something called an ISWC, which I think Stella talked about this morning. That's an identifier for a music composition. And then there are also identifiers called IPI or interested party identifier that are used with songwriters and music publishers. So each of the songwriters has an IPI and separately each of the publishing companies has an IPI. Then on the sound recording side, we have the ISRC, the International Standard Recording Code for the sound recording and the USUM there denotes United States Universal Music, Universal Music Group, the artist, of course, is Lady Gaga, Red One is the producer, and the label is Interscope. So these are all elements of basic transaction metadata that have to be tracked and stored in various places. Then we show the different, uh, the other different aspects of copyright infrastructure that are involved here. Royalty administrators, entities that process all this stuff. There's the record label, Universal. There is something called the MLC, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, which is something that was established very recently by law in the United States to process mechanical royalties for streaming music services such as Spotify. And then there is also a performance rights organization, which is a form of CMO, collective management organization. In this case, it's BMI, which is one of the handful of CMOs in the United States. I think there are a couple of major ones here in Korea. Then there are some protocols involved, and there's a family of standards in the music industry for protocols known as DDEX. And here we have two DDEX uh, protocols involved. One is ERN, which stands for Electronic Release Notification, and that's a feed of metadata that the record label, in this case Interscope, feeds to the music service, in this case Spotify. The other is the Digital Sales Report, or DSR standard, which is how Spotify sends lab, uh, the label information about this music play on the service. Then there is something called Common Works Registration or CWR, which is data about the composition and the rights holders that the music publishers send to the CMO, which is BMI in this case. <clears throat> then we have registries and databases that store this information. And there are two main ones in this case. One is the registry or database of the MLC, which is publicly accessible by law. It's run by a nonprofit and they make their database available to the public in certain ways. Then there's BMI, which has its own database, although BMI does also have a web interface so that anyone can look at their data uh, through that web interface. So we've seen all these infrastructure elements. <clears throat> Where do these things come from? Where they come from the different places that I showed in the previous slide. They come from laws, such as the law establishing the MLC and the fact that the mechanical royalties are set by law. They're not set by negotiation among the parties, they're set by law. And there is also a, a legal precedent that says performance royalties are payable on music streams separately from the mechanicals. And this is something that the US has and it's not necessarily true in other countries. For example, I don't believe it's true in South Korea. There are industry conventions that come into play that are not actually codified in law, but are just set by, uh, by convention, by common practice, such as the fact that a PRO such as BMI negotiates what's called a blanket license with a music service based on how much percent of the music services catalog is controlled by BMI as opposed to other PROs such as ASCAP and CSAC. Then we have various standards and Sarah talked about, or Stella, sorry, talk, talked about some of these. Standards for identifiers, standards for metadata, standard protocols for conveying that information. We have entrepreneurship that has resulted in services and technologies that are used here. Spotify was the result of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in Sweden over 10 years ago. There are technologies for automatic identification of content based on its uh, the bits in this in the audio file and there's work in progress on automated identification of compositions musical compositions melodies lyrics and so on and then there's automated technology for capturing metadata about sound recordings at the time that they're created in the studio 
and of course various types of experimentation and establishment of best practices. So there are a number of lessons that we can learn about each of these areas that I want to go into briefly. One is that the technical standards for distribution of content are now really controlled by the distributors and not by the content owners, uh, as we'll see. Another uh, lesson that we've learned is that standards have to develop together with the market. They cannot develop separately. Another lesson is that repositories or databases and registries need incentives to be able to flourish. They can't flourish without incentives. And then the last lesson that I want to talk about is that the scale of internet content distribution forces lots of radical changes in the industry. So let's talk about each one of them briefly. One is distributor capture of consumption standards. It used to be that um, the content owners wanted to own those standards, but that didn't really turn out that way. So for example, DRMs, which are, as you may know, ways of encrypting content so that only the credentialed user can access it in only the prescribed ways. Those are mostly controlled by downstream entities and not by content owners. For example, for eBooks, the DRMs are all controlled by the major eBook distributors such as Amazon, Apple, and Kobo. The one exception to that is Redium LCP for EPUB, which is something that I actually helped develop. In music, there are proprietary DRMs that each music service has uh, developed on its own, such as Spotify, Apple, Google, and so on. Um, in the video world, there are essentially three major DRMs developed by Google, Microsoft, and Apple that all of the major online video streaming services use. <clears throat> and in this diagram, it shows red for proprietary and black for standard, and very few of these things are at least on the right side, the DRM side are black. The formats are standard formats in many cases, but they're ones that are not controlled by content owners. They're controlled by third party standards bodies um, such as MPEG. The next lesson is that standards in the market must develop together. Some things that we have learned don't work well are to don't not implement anything until every last detail of a standard is agreed. Um, a better approach is what we call a minimum viable approach where you put out something that's a minimum viable standard and you test it in the market and you iterate until something that's actually worthwhile and implementable is achieved. <clears throat> uh, standards organizations as closed clubs with non-disclosure agreements are generally not as effective as standards organizations that invite entrepreneurs and make their specs publicly available. And de facto standards developed by private companies are not preferable compared to faster open standards development processes. If you can get to open standards faster, then that's a better outcome than having private companies control these technologies. Lesson is that registries need incentives to, to be developed and flourish. The data has to be correct, it has to be complete, and it has to be current, up to date. Repositories have to be accessible, they have to be reliable. There needs to be ways of, of um, resolving disputes about the data in equitable ways. All of this is not cheap. It's all expensive and it all requires appropriate governance. What is the right model for achieving those results? Well, we're not sure yet. There are a lot of different models involving who owns these registries and whether they're for-profit or non-profit whether they're mandated by law or just established in the marketplace. Here are some examples of each of these models. Uh, in Korea, there is Comca, which is one of the PROs and also mechanical rights organizations. It's the CMO for music compositions or one of them. It's a private nonprofit that's a common model for such things. There are private for-profit collective management organizations or identifier uh, standards bodies, such as the ISBN agency for books in Germany, which happens to be for profit. There are consortia of, in this case, movie studios for the Eider standard. That's a consortium model as opposed to a private separate entity. As I mentioned, the MLC for streaming mechanicals of music in the United States was established by legal mandate. 
and the latest type of uh, governance model, one that we're, we're in the very early stages of, and it's interesting and exciting, is a blockchain model where it's ownerless, where there's some technology involved, but there is no owner of the data. It's out on a public blockchain or semi-public blockchain, which has no one owner. And Verisart is a, is a startup company in the US that handles um, visual artwork registra ownership registrations and resale registrations on a blockchain. So those are all different governance models and we're not sure which are the best ones and it may be that there is no best one. It's all very situation specific. So scale forces change. The scale of the internet is unprecedented compared to anything that came before and that's forced a lot of change in the industry of, of content. Different industries have different, of course, ways of operating and they've changed in different ways. But Music, again, is a good example. And composition mechanical licensing for interactive music streaming has forced a lot of change in the industry because, first of all, streaming is now an industry that worldwide has trillions, if not tens of trillions of streams per year, as opposed to, for example, the number of people per year who bought vinyl albums back in the, let's say, 1970s, 1960s. Each of these streams has to be matched to a composition that underlies the sound recording, and that is a, a job that is sometimes non-trivial. And then all the licensing has to be done with all the ownership splits and so on. This is all a very complicated task, made even more complicated by the fact that musical creators put out so much music every day, every week, every year. Spotify supposedly ingests about 60,000 tracks new tracks every day, 365 days a year. That's several orders of magnitude, more music than was issued back in, let's say the 1980s when CDs were coming out. All of them must be licensed properly and that's a huge job. So music is the leading edge case. There's been some success, of course not complete success, but there've been some successes in music. And one of the reasons why music is a uh, leading edge case is because there is a, a tractability about the music universe or a, a, it makes it easier than in some other cases to solve these problems. You have simple atomic units of commerce, compositions, sound recordings of those compositions, albums containing sound recordings of those compositions. They're well understood units. You have a small set of basic rights to those um, atomic units that are defined in law, reproduction, distribution, and communication to the public, Communication to the public is a right understood in, in the EU, not in the US. There's a fairly small set of conventional usage rules that we've been uh, discussing, given some examples, and there's standard identifiers that map to these atomic units of commerce that are widely used, such as the ISWC and ISRC. And there are factors that are forcing technological change, such as the enormous uh, transaction volumes, new content, and demand for precision and transparency and royalty payments. So contrast this with a less tractable universe of content, which would be higher education and academic publishing, where each work such as a textbook or an academic monograph is not a neat little atomic unit, but a very complex work that has potentially thousands of, thousands of licensed or licensable parts. The, um, size and nature of which vary widely. Each product has a lot of different variations. Products are not identical across delivery channels, for example, in different countries, different editions, digital versus print and so on. There's a large and expanding set of usage rules and domains with a lot more uh, varied and granular rights that are licensed. Again, not simple atomic um, items of licensing. And then we have a world of identifiers that don't necessarily map to licensable items. For example, an ISBN number doesn't necessarily map to a specific or general ebook edition of a book. It might map to a specific you know, distributor of that ebook, or it might map to all ebooks in general of a specific book. It's really up to the publisher. And there are other examples of that. And then of course, these items of content take very long times to develop um, editorially and in terms of production. 
So that's what makes higher education and academic publishing a more difficult set of examples to solve in copyright infrastructure. So that was a very quick tour of copyright infrastructure and our final slide. Um, I've packed a lot into 20 minutes, but I'm very happy to take questions and invite emails and other forms of inquiry. Here is my contact information. Uh, email is the best way to get in touch with me. I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. And so with that, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. 네, 영상 잘 봤습니다. Thank you very much for your video presentation.